Rolling. This was no problem at all. Uh, the, the, because when I was in 90, August 1940, I was with National Cash Register Company, and I, as I was uh, walking around, I decided that, well, I may as well be in this, look, look something to be get, it, get into, and something which was necessary. So I went up to the recruiting office uh, and uh, asked them, could I become a, a maintenance fitter? And they said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I said, as a matter of fact, I work for National Cash Register Company. And I said, by the way, I said, I've got with me a book which I can explain to you what I do. So I pulled the book out and traced out the workings of the flying cams and et cetera, to pull in the various registers as they operated. And he said, he said, oh, he said, we won't be... Uh, uh, we want instrument fitters and that's what you're going to be. So in time, no, no five second flat, I was an instrument fitter from there on in. Okay, let's just pause there, chat amongst yourselves for a sec. Okay, we're just going to have a test on the sound of the again. That's great, Morris. That's all I want you to do, just talk. You feel comfortable? Yep. yep. You're sitting comfortably in the chair? Yep. I'm rolling. Does no. that sound? Just a minute. Sorry. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about Does that. Does that sound all right? That's good. Don't all right. worry about it. It's all right. Yeah, all right. rolling. Everything Set. under control. Okay. Boris, where were you in the war when you decided to volunteer? I just arrived at at Bowen in Queensland, northern Queensland, as a sergeant from Darwin and then Meraki in in uh, Dutch New Guinea, which uh, was. A fairly active situation. We got down to, as I said, to the flying maintenance base. Start again. You didn't tell me anything before. Hmm? Okay. And you said, as I said, you didn't tell me anything before. So start again. You've never told me this story before. Yeah. Okay. Where were you in the war when you decided to volunteer? I was at. Uh, you, sorry. Start again. You're right. Job. What you want me to do is to give these short answers, no, right? No, no. I want you to tell me. When you say, as I said, I can't, you never told me anything before, okay? Presume right, you've never right. spoken to me before. Right, right, okay? right. Okay, Morris, where were you in the war where you decided to volunteer? I was at number one flying boat maintenance base at Bowen in northern Queensland. The uh, I'd just come down from Meraki uh, and it was from an active situation and things were... Uh, starting to be a bit quiet and I was very very bored with the whole thing at, because it was a sta static situation the we worked from workshops and uh, it was life was not was a very quiet situation what prompted you to volunteer the there came out in DROs a request for volunteers to do a to join a gas experimental situation about which we knew not very little if nothing about uh, there was several boys volunteered subsequently there was only two that went from Bowen what made you want to volunteer though my the reason why I volunteered was because I was bored the whole it was just not after active service things was very very quiet uh, I just couldn't come to grips with this with this quietness so I decided well this was this was a way by which we could at least get back into an active situation did you think by volunteering you could help the war effort well this of course was the they wouldn't be we considered, at least I considered, that we would not be asked if it wasn't necessary. And it didn't really worry me that much. Uh, as again, I said, this was an area where we, uh, uh, with boredom, it was something which you just can't beat. Tell me why you did it to help the war effort. Well, as a matter of fact, when I, when I was, and carrying on that, situation. I uh, was came out of Meraki in a trop, 
tropo state in actual fact. I was considered, uh, I was sent down from Meraki for a 14 days leave and in, in this situation I am sure that I must have been pretty bad because the situation up there was very critical and flight space was also very critical. Tell me about the war effort and the reasons you volunteered. The reason for volunteering was to uh, assist the war effort because the, they had actually called for it and they would not have called for it unless it was necessary. And as I said, we were very uh, insular up where we were. We were just going about our business like as if it was a normal uh, unit. What were you told about what you'd volunteered for? The, there was no information given about what we were going to do when we arrived at this uh, experimental unit. The whole situation was a very hush-hush affair in actual fact. Uh, there was nothing, nothing came through as far as I was concerned anyway. I knew nothing of it and I was uh, very much in the dark. In what way was the secrecy impressed upon you? Well, the, uh, as far as the secrecy concerned was because we were just not told anything. We, were not, uh, we just went into Proserpine cold. When we got to Proserpine, I could, I could see the reason why no one was told anything. Because this experimental unit, uh, gas experimental unit, was of such a nature that uh, one wouldn't quite n want this to get out anyway. Did they tell you you couldn't speak to anybody about it? No, there was no, no secrecy as far as that was concerned. Uh, and yet, this I would say, going back through the memory banks, this is right, because I didn't write to my wife. In fact, she, at that period of time, she didn't know where I was. Uh, for that very reason of the secrecy angle. So I would say, yes, it was a very secret situation. What were you required to write? Battery run out. Oh, we we'll just changed batteries. Going well, Morris. Absolutely swimmingly. <laughs> you right? Yeah. Okay. Morris, how did you get to Proserpine? We, when I was posted to Proserpine, or at least I was attached to Proserpine from Bowen, I would, when I arrived, I found I was in charge of a flight of 25 boys and a corporal. Uh, they all these bods were were actually recruited from situations all over Australia, and uh, there was not a great deal of of camaraderie about it because no one knew anybody. The uh, job itself, and they all seemed pretty interested in what they were doing, and everybody, I think went in legally to try and do the best job that they could do. Uh, the job itself presented itself was rather difficult in that uh, the, the, it was far, far greater than, than I ever imagined it to be. It was worse on the body than I ever imagined it to be. Uh, we had no concept when we, were, when we actually uh, applied for this situation or the plight for this posting. The whole, the, uh, it proved to be that men were required at various periods to don gas masks and wear them overnight, uh, wear them for, for route marches uh, through various areas. Respirations were all then taken. The pre-ignited gas uniforms were distributed and these were worn with a view to getting a reaction from the personal uh, perspiration, etc. Uh, but most importantly, the, the job was to test people out in a gas situation to see just what would be, could happen to a person in the uh, climate, which of course was tropical. How did you feel when you learned what you'd be required to do? I was... Uh, not exactly uh, upset by it. It was a job to be done, and as such, having volunteered, I decided well, this is the only this had to be done and done properly, and I was determined that it would be done properly, because that was what we came were there for, 
and there's no reason why it shouldn't be done properly. You weren't concerned about your health? I'm afraid I didn't even think of my health. I didn't even think that we would suffer as much as we did. I also didn't think that it would affect us as much as it did. I assumed that we would have a bit of a burn and uh, possibly uh, like sunburn or something of this nature, but the deepness of the burn was something I didn't really anticipate. What had you heard about the use of gas before? Well, the use of gas before was uh, namely as a surprise area when it would descended on people who were unprepared for it. We would go into these chambers at least with modern gas masks and, uh, as I thought, well protected. What did you heard about the use of gas in the First War? Well, the use of gas in the First War was such that uh, I had... I knew of people that were gassed and I knew of a lot of, of friends of my dad's who were, who were pretty badly off, affected by gas, from lung problems and that sort of thing. And it was uh, quite a serious area and it has been and will be always a serious area because we must control it, otherwise we could be subject to the same thing again. From what you knew of gas in the First War, weren't you worried that that could happen to you? Strangely enough, I wasn't over-concerned. I thought, well, if it did happen, we would be covered anyway and we would be looked after and nursed back if anything happened. And, uh, and I didn't anticipate anything going wrong anyway because I, was, I had faith in, in our service areas. Describe to me what you had to do when you went into the gas chamber. In the gas chamber itself, it was rather a, a hectic situation. We had previously had one set of boys go in and do a five hour stint in the chamber under a diluted situ situation of gas to see just what it was all about. This gave us some insight of what to expect when we went in. When we went in, I took with me the corporal and two other airmen. And the object of the exercise was to pick up gunny sacks filled with sand from one corner of the chamber and carry it across to the other corner of the chamber. This went on until the pile was in a corner. From there we then sat down for a few moments and then picked the bags up again and carted them back to the next, the other corner. It was not long before we were covered in, in, in perspiration or actually sweat. We, were, we really sweated in that chamber. This actually ignited, went through all our clothing. It picked up the gas that was in the, in the air and clung to the uniforms, of which we were subsequently aware of, but not at that time. The, uh, it, after a couple of hours, we really became very, very tired. We were in a, uh, an area, a confined area, where heat was, similar, was, well, in a tropical atmosphere, must be hot, and this, was very, very, very wearing on our bodies. We felt very, very drained during the process of this gas operation. Towards the end of, the, of this two hour stint, we were quite disoriented. We uh, sort of going about the whole thing by rote. We just carried on as if things were just going on and that was it. Because time, in two, up with two hours time, it was a long while. Uh, if you stand still for two minutes at, the, in, at, the, at silence in Anzac Day, you feel it's a long while. You can imagine being in a, an area for two hours. It, takes, it is a long period. We also started to get very drowsy and heat exhausted. Uh, this was sensed by the boys and the uh, 
girls who, from the uh, uh, RAP areas, and uh, they sang songs, told stories, joked, did anything to uh, keep our morale up. And uh, eventually the two hours did fortunately disappear. By that time we were completely saturated uh, and so bloody glad to get out of that uh, chamber, it wasn't funny. What sort of songs did they sing while you're in there, Morris? Tell me about the songs they sang. And well, they sang all sorts of songs, but on, one that one. Hey, Morris, describe to me what it was like, how they kept you going, you know, how they cheered you up and sang songs. And well, and they... just, just going to that and, okay, go. The, the, the girls from the RAP situation and uh, technical areas kept us going by singing songs of all Australiana, uh, modern songs or, of that era, of course, uh, things which uh, uh, you were associated with. Roll Out the Barrel, Road to Gundy Guy, and in fact, I can still uh, hear this... Uh, track winding back coming through the PA because you could the actual um, chamber was soundproof and all this was only to transfer sound had to come through a PA into the chamber and uh, I can still hear the, these songs being sung. The um, Road of Gundy Guy was a, was, was a typical one and it, I very well associated with it and it goes something like there's a track winding back to an old-fashioned shack along the road to Gandhi Guy where the blue gums are blowing the marambidgee's flowing amidst the summer sky where my daddy and mammy are waiting for me and the girls of my childhood once more I will see and no more will I roam when I heading straight for home along the road to Gander Guy. So it's an association. Did that cheer you up? The, uh, yes, because you've got, these were old areas, old songs, and uh, it did lift us up. And strangely enough, did get us over that last quarter hour, which we were really, really battling about. What it was like, what sort of clothes you wore, did it protect you at all from the gas? When we went into the chamber, all we wore was a uh, gas mask and our very light summer uniforms, uh, Air Force uniforms, which consisted of sh uh, a light shirt, long sleeved, uh, drab pants, heavy boots uh, and uh, a belt. The only part of me that wasn't wasn't burnt in actual fact was where the belt was, and which it was tight. But the whole, the, everywhere where the uh, uniform had was sweaty and collected this uh, gas became completely sore and completely impregnated. And the worst areas were those which were ex were damp, really damp. And that's namely the do you want to get uh, the crotch, and uh, sorry, start that again. Yeah. Tell me, to explain to me in detail where you like where you've got your private parts. Like, oh, right, right. Start that bit again. Uh, the worst areas affected were obviously where the dampness was, and the in between the crotch and up under the armpits and around the backs of the legs, where the actual. Uh, sweat accumulated and carried the gas became very very much like tripe in fact my scrotum was just completely like tripe and towards the end of the ordeal became even corpuscles of blood were coming out and uh, it was not very nice to say the least how did you tolerate the pain well Firstly, before we got to that area, there was other things happened. We had to report after the gas chamber to the uh, 
RAP and the, the girls next morning that is of course and they uh, they gave us a glug to take now before we took the glug this glug incidentally was just farex in a without milk or sugar and it was in a beaker but before we did that we took that we were given a snake to swallow now this snake was was consisted of a long plastic or long rubber tube uh, with a clip on the end. The clip was very essential because that put to our ear if we swallowed that's the rubber we would have been in more trouble than enough. So that went down into the stomach and the uh, aid came up. Uh, Start again. Not the aid. The The, we, we had to report to the lab next morning and the lab assistant took, gave us a snake to follow. This snake was not, as is in the true words, as a snake, but rather a long piece of tube, rubber tube, and it had a clip on the end of it. Just, this, a, moment, just a moment. How's the sound, Chris? The, the rain's getting a bit loud out here. getting loud. Keep on going. No? Okay, And start again. Sorry. We reported to the lab assistant next morning at 8 a.m. and with and under strict instructions not to have any breakfast. The when we arrived, she gave us a, a snake to swallow. This snake consisted of a long length of rubber tubing to which it was attached a clip. The clip was to go on our ear so as to make sure we didn't swallow, swallow it. And having swallowed it with much gurking and coughing and lots of other problems, we eventually got it down. The, then the clip was placed on our ear so as not to lose it. The lab assistant then came forward and periodically with a syringe removed the contents of the stomach which was a glug given to us to drink, which was consisted of pharynx without milk or sugar. As she extracted this glug every quarter to half an hour, so surely but surely, the, there was a change in the stomach content and eventually all she was getting out was gastric juices. And that was a very long wait and a very long time before to, to dinner. We were very, very, very hungry, I can assure you. What other things did they do to, to look at how the mustard gas affected you? Uh, the, from there we started to uh, go to assault courses, route marches and work to produce this area of heat on the body to which was infected. The, uh, towards the end of, of the first couple of days I felt that I was being, had been a very, very, very bad dose of, of uh, sunburn. From then it stripped away and became pussy with the water breaking away from the blisters and the whole of our area which was impregnated with the gas that was dampened became like a stop now we've gone through that do you want no, me to no. do it again i want you to describe to me you know I no mean, i know we but we can go through it again it's okay but you know, well you can cut the other out then yeah that's all right we can do it we'll, we'll go don't worry about that morris just well let's see i was i've lost the about, you start talking about the i've lost the course. chronologically okay, system don't worry about it the assault course yeah. Tell me about going, how your body was coping with the assault course. Yes. Well, well, event over the when we got to the assault course and um, when we came to the route marching, which was six to seven miles, and then using the assault course every day, the body became very very saturated again with perspiration this 
tended to uh, to hurt the areas that had been infected by the gas and subsequently as we went this whole area became like a piece of tripe I can't explain it any better than that and then eventually as time went on the skin then started to bring blood through after two and a half weeks of this agony of jumping over salt courses and marching the uh, doctors said to me why don't you give up every morning after we went to the uh, had our blood taken we had to report to the doctor and as time went on so he marked on silhouettes of the male form the progress of the gas and this was in red ink eventually there was a mass of red ink all around the areas which were affected by the gas he said to me after two and a half weeks Morris why don't you give up and I said but you don't want me to give up really what you want to find out is the extent to which I would become a casualty in the case of a gas attack he said that's right so I said well and my corporal with me agreed we could go on so at the end of the third week we decided well that we would both had enough anyway we were weeping blood and so we said that's enough it was with great relief that we got out into that bed eventually in the hospital that's a bit unconvincing no it's great it's terrific now Morris um, tell me the story of after that when you went on a picnic Well, comes a day when uh, it, there came a day when eventually the skin had cleaned up, and uh, we d were invited this other corporal and myself. And I'm unfortunately I can't remember his name. I dearly loved her because he, I, I reckon he was a great, really great guy. We were invited on a on a picnic to with the staff. Uh, we were the only two invited, uh, so that must have been something of a compliment. So we duly get into a, an ambulance and uh, go down to the water's edge for this sausage picnic and seeing the water and be relaxing quite nicely, I decided it was a great day for a swim. So I checked down and in with underpants and off I dived into the water. Well, if I'd have beaten Johnny Wiesmuller that day to get out again because every, every we were burnt, where we were burnt, this was absolute brine on, and it was just stung something awful and I thought I was better. So when I came out, I didn't care what happened. I just threw everything down and wiped myself furiously. It was something really to believe, I can tell you. It really hurt. Where did it hurt? Well, whatever I was affected, particularly between the legs. <laughs> so there's no way that... Uh, there was any uh, that uh, there was just no way that we could uh, uh, relax again until we got really better. Yeah. As we can collect that out. <clears throat> what do you think about this talk about all these blokes um, having these affairs with these women there? Well, I don't know about this, but my experience, particularly, would be that it would be impossible. What would be? Start again and tell me. Uh, well. The, there were was, was stories around the camp that uh, there was the AWOs were uh, being uh, obliging, uh, but uh, as far as to my experience, there was just no way that any volunteer would ever been able cap capable of associating with a girl, because it was just just not on, and it was just so impractical it wasn't even funny. As a result of. As a result of your exposure to mustard gas? As a result of the gas, as a result of, as a result of the, of the mustard gas experiments, in 1969, I believe, I uh, suffered a very, very big operation in which they removed a tumour from my kidney. In fact, 
they took away a portion of the kidney as a re and as a result of which I had a bit of a domino effect. Firstly, the appendix was covered and then I had a peritonitis. And the peritonitis, when they went in to fix it, they had to remove several feet of my intestine because it was plugged all around the thing. This around the uh, intestines, around the actual... Um, Can you tell me the story, Morris? You, you were talking about the tumour being as big as an orange. Test time to be. Remember when you told me about the tumour, it was as big as an orange? Yes, I did. But I was kind of, I can't, uh, I, I lost the. Uh, Let's start uh, again. Parrot, Still rolling. Peritonea. Right. Uh, so I'll ask you the question again. Morris, as a result of your exposure to mustard gas, do you think you've suffered any health effects? Yes, I believe that a big operation I had in 1969 uh, in which I had a huge tumour larger than a, an, an orange removed from my kidney, in fact a portion of the kidney had was removed at the same time, that uh, this was direct res uh, result of the gas through the pores of the skin and eventually into the bloodstream and being absorbed by the kidney and as a result of that operation I also had a strangle peritonea which turned into peritonitis when the doctor had an emergency operation he had to cut yards of, of, of my intestines away to get at the per peritonitis so as to remove it all this then had a domino effect. Firstly, I have a now have a result of that a, uh, a problem with my tummy, in that I now have two uh, <coughs> yes a minute okay. two. This is the problem. Uh, two a the name 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 name. I forget my own, let alone anybody else's. Really? Morris, do you think you've suffered any health effects as a result of your exposure to mustard gas? As a re uh, I'm, in my belief, as a result of the mustard gas experiments through the gas seeping through the pores of the skin, which have been subsequently been proved is pretty lethal, this affected my kidney as a subsequent of which I had a mammoth growth on the kidney and t uh, the uh, tumour was then removed and portion of my kidney. This was a pretty massive operation because it happened in an accident and they had they operated from the front rather from the back and I was completely replaced. When this was done, the peritonea was not in exactly the right position. So it was strangulated and created peritonitis in a later date. It's getting so complicated. Why don't you just tell me about the tumour the size of the orange and what your wife has told? Right. Okay. Right. Uh, as a result of the mustard it gas. It was getting complicated, I couldn't count more, but you, the more you talk, the more you talk, the more you go. Right. As a result of the mustard gas. As a result of the as a result of the mustard gas, I believe that I had an enormous tumour removed from my kidney, which was a result of mustard gas, uh, which I believe is a result of mustard gas. Start again. Start again. What is this bit? The size of an orange. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> I, in 1969, I believe as a result of the mustard gas experiments and the fact that the absorption of the skin, I had an enormous uh, this reminds me of these bloody you know things you see on TV. That's right. Let's bloopers, bloopers, bloopers. Let's start again. The tumour. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Right. As a result of this mustard gas experiment, I had an enormous tumour removed from my kidney. The, in fact, they removed some of the kidney as well, in the belief that it was a, it was a cancerous that was the size of a big orange, according to the doctor, and Vern was my worth. Let's start again. <laughs> You're going really well. Let's start again, Morris. Your wife. Okay, Morris. We'll start over again. As a result of the mustard gas experiments, do you think you've suffered any health effects? Uh, yes, I really do. I've, no, I can't say yes. As a result of, of my mustard gas experiments, exposure I feel that I did because in 1916 as, as a result of my mustard gas experiments I believe I had a enormous growth taken off my kidney the size of an orange and in fact a portion of the kidney removed I also believe that my wife was told by the doctor that to get my affairs in order because it was cancerous. This, however, after two biopsies were taken on his instruction, proved to be benign. As a result of that operation, I had a strangled uh, peritonea which became peritonitis and was a very, very big operation because it was three and a half inches away from where it ought to have been, according to the doctor that did the job. Also, as a result of the gas, I have had several uh, sun spots removed. In fact, some were cancerous and had skin grafts to cover them. So in actual fact, my reaction from the gas was pretty solid, I believe. How do you feel now about having been a volunteer for mustard gas experiments? Well, as far as being a volunteer for mustard gas in... re-examining my thoughts then, as now, my mustard gas experiments and my volunteering portions, I think I would do the same thing again under the similar circumstances because the necessity was there to be done. Somebody had to do it. However, the amount of pain, etc., that we went through in the doing of this was not conducive. But this is only in the light of latter light. Um, I have certainly paid for it as far as my physical being is concerned. Uh, I have a, um, a, a pretty big... Uh, you have a what, Morris? Just go on hernia. I have a pretty big hernia and a, an umbilical hernia, which inconvenienced me greatly. I can't lift any great weights, but you, these things are as a result of, and you can't think about that or associate now with then. Why not? Well, my... I felt that if I had to make the same decision, and I do believe I'd do the same decision again, that I would volunteer again. This might sound silly, but that's the way I feel about it. How do you feel about being used for as a volunteer while the British and the Americans were really essentially running the show? The Americans and British were in charge of the situations and they were pretty level-headed to a great degree. Uh, 
Australian doctors whom I dealt with were very fair. And in fact, all the situations I ran into up at Proserpine, in my opinion, were given with the best of thoughts. But like it's the old story, when do you when when does Australia Australia and when is America America and when is Britain Britain? Uh, unfortunately, we have a trio in lots of our situations, and as such, has to be accepted. I'm pretty equal about that. What does that mean, Mark? Even-headed, even-minded. You don't mind. Happy with it. You didn't mind the fact that I'm running the show. I was not aware of who was running the show. In actual fact, in as far as the running of the area up there was concerned, I didn't know who was running it, who was responsible for it. We as volunteers just did a job. We were not concerned with uh, who was the supplying the money, who was, who was, uh, and what was being done, or who was involving the experiments. All we did was carry them out, and I'm sure none of our fellows uh, thought about who, what, when or why. If they had, they would have probably been there. How disciplined were you towards the men you were in charge of in that life? Disciplinary action, or... Discipline was reasonably easy to maintain in lots of ways. At times, you had to be hard, but Seeing as I didn't have any service police or to dictate what was going on, I managed to get around it pretty well by taking tasks off people that were not capable of doing them and giving the task to someone else who was capable of doing it and who would see the task got done. This was our greatest problem, or the, to make sure the task that was being given was done. For instance, sometimes in the morning I'd wake, I'd get up and find that uh, the gas mask, which should have been worn all night, was not being worn all night. Well, the only way out of that was to reallocate the task until it was completed satisfactory. There was no other way of doing the job. Were you trying to set an example for your men? A person who, who a person who leads, who is in charge of a squad. A person in charge of a, a platoon of men or a flight of men must always lead by example. I'm sure that I did everything that I could to lead the way. I'm sure my corporal did all the way, led all the way, and I'm sure that everybody. I'm sure that I am sure that most people who were associated there gave. 90% of their effort. There was the odd five whom you would never get to work in an iron lung. However, those, we managed to get round that because, as I said, by the reallocation of jobs and uh, to the satisfaction of everybody. I had no problem at all with the staff. I just did as I was told. Actually, I did what I, they were requested to be done and I just carried out the job that was as I saw it. There was no worries at all. Morris, well, let's do two of those things at the start again. Where were you in the war when you decided to volunteer? I had just come down from Meraki to Bowen and joined the flying boat maintenance base. I'd Sorry, Bowen, we Rocky were, when, Bowen, where? I'm starting to get that question again. Where were you in the war when you decided to volunteer? I was situated at number one flying boat maintenance base at Bowen in northern Queensland. I had just come down from Meraki and in a very active situation. We were uh, quite active up there and we came down to a more or less inactive st static situation in that we worked from a shop, we uh, are literally a shop in, in Bowen uh, 
just centre. Uh, we did our work down on aircraft as they came in. It was a sort of a re unrelated war effort, as a consequence of which we became bored and uh, nothing really gelled. As we, when we, they called for volunteers through the daily routine orders to, uh, for, to go down to uh, Proserpine a, on the uh, gas related area, I volunteered because I felt that that was what to had done, but also the fact that I was also so browned off the area in which we were that uh, I just wanted to change. I also felt that our, the war effort would be helped because this was a job which had to be done. What prompted you to volunteer? Well, I volunteered because the fact that we were browned off, uh, as far as I was concerned, we were the war effort. As a, an, a, I joined up because, A, I came out of uh, Meraki, Bowen. Right. I I joined up. I played. I applied for this uh, you want to stop, Morris? No, no, no. Yeah. I applied for this gas experimental area because I felt I'd just come out of, of uh, Meraki. I'd come down and I was tropo, actually. The uh, and I was really browned off the fact that we were so inactive. Uh, when you get into an active area and are really active, it you've got a different application. You're on the move, you've got uh, full objectivity, things has to be done and things have got to be got away at certain areas. At Proserpine, this was not so. It was just an ordinary operating unit and we just went about our work in a normal application without any degree of direct urgency. What were you told about what you were volunteering for? Well, when we applied there was no instructions given as to what form of this would take. We knew nothing about other that we were going to be other than uh, used as uh, guinea pigs as, and gas experiments but what experiments these were, we knew nothing about. And so, you know, like, I just joined up. Tell me about how keen you were. Yes, well, you had to be keen to even think about joining. There was, we felt that this, this was a worthwhile application. It had to be done and we just went ahead and did it. Let me tell you the same thing and maybe throw in the king's mustard, eh? Hey? Tell me the same thing and throw in the king's mustard. All right. Yes. Well, we uh, when this applicate when the when they cooked when DROs were were read out and I saw that uh, they really wanted this to be done, I decided. But I was pretty browned off. And uh, I could uh, was pretty keen about this. In fact, as as keen as mustard, as the saying goes. And we uh, duly went down to uh, Proserpine as a as a uh, volunteer. All right. Finish. I was just trying to get a laugh out of you saying keen as mustard because it's pretty funny, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want to try again? Yeah, I laughed, didn't I? That's good. I want you to laugh. It's funny. Keen as Mustard is a pretty ironic title, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Tell me oh, well, I can say as the name implies then, Keen as Mustard. No, no, just ignore the name. All right. But, uh, you know, just so it's a funny thing, think of it like that. Right. When DROs came out, we went down and to the uh, 
uh, orderly room and put my application in. Uh, I was uh, very keen, in fact as keen as mustard was one might say, and uh, duly reported to Proserpine uh, as uh, a volunteer for uh, anything that would be done because we all felt, and I felt, that, that 95% of the, of the flight felt that this was a job that had to be done and had to be done properly. Great, Morris. Is there anything else you want to say? Pardon? Is there anything else you want to say? No. Here is the first lesson. Great. That was great. Thanks, Morris. <laughs> no, I just will say. Then there's something I do want to say. I think we might have stopped. Okay. We'll no, we haven't stopped. Rolling. Okay, we're still rolling. The my reaction to the whole deal is the fact that it was a worthwhile situation. It had to be done. My physical reaction to it in this period of time is one which I could have well done without. But this, of course, is in hindsight. And there's lots of things we do, if you want to think about them after, that one wouldn't be in. However, I'm pleased I was in it. I'm glad I did it. And... Uh, the consequences are, uh, are with me. Right, just one other thing, Morris. Remember the commendation card? We've... Can you oh, describe yes. that to me? Yes, I describe it. Okay, very quickly. I was, I was, the commendation car, uh, certificate was given to me uh, at Parafield, late, latterly, uh, and also my corporal got one at the same Parafield base, and uh, we. Uh, were very proud and still am very proud of that uh, presentation. What was it? It was a commendation of good service on behalf of uh, Air, Air Marshal Jones and uh, Air Vice Marshal Jones. It was a commendation on behalf of... I got... Hmm? I got a commendation. Yeah. Well, I got a commendation, at least I got a recommendation and a commendation signed by Air, Air Vice Marshal Jones and to say that uh, my application for uh, discipline, etc., etc., was very good and was appreciated. Did it say anything about chemical weapons? Didn't say anything about chemical warfare? Well, uh, the, the ke That's it. No. Morris, what sort of recognition did you get for being in the experiments? I was presented with a, a commendation card signed by uh, Air Vice Marshal Jones at a ceremonial presentation in Sydney, Parafield to be precise, towards the end of the war. This was a certificate of good service for application uh, to duty during the war. There is no allusion or anything done in or spoken about in the citation that mentioned mustard gas. But there was nothing else I did in the war that could have had one. Okay. Well, tell me again, but tell me, um, you suppose it was because you were, you did it, you worked hard at it and you were silly enough or whatever. All oh, right, that's it? right. But tell me again. Um, at Parafield, towards the end of the war, I was presented at a ceremonial parade, and my corporal also, with a certificate of good service signed by Air Vice Marshal Jones. This was given to us for application of duty and uh, sticking to the job during our stay at uh, Process. Start again, start again. Process. Start again. Okay. That'll be in the road. Right. Um, towards the end of the war, I was called to have to Parafield to have a presentation of a certificate at a ceremonial parade signed by Air Vice Marshal Jones for good service. This was given to us, my corporal and myself, for application of duty 
during our stay at Proserpine. No, you gotta tell me about what was on it, how there was nothing on about the gas and how you supposed it was because Oh you want me to say that? Yeah. I didn't thought it was it I No, same thing here. Right. During towards the end of the war at a ceremonial parade at Parafield, situated north of Sydney, I was presented with a certificate of good service. This also was done to my corporal. The, this certificate of, of good service was signed by Air Vice Marshal Jones and the uh, covered application to, of duty during the war. This was did not make any reference at all to the uh, use of gas or our volunteering at Proserpine, but which I presume it did refer, right? <laughs> Except you say right at the end. I'm not here, Morris. You what? I'm not here. You're not here. You said right at the end to me. Right. One more time, okay? You're not here. Well, I was looking at you then, was I? Look at me. Right. Tell me the story again. Towards the end of the war, I was called to a ceremonial parade at Parafield in north of Sydney for a presentation of a certificate of good service. This was signed by Air Vice Marshal Jones. There was, n in the citation, there was no reference to the uh, actual use of mustard gas at Proserpine, but rather it was a devotion to good duty and good service. This, I presume, was in actual fact awarded on account of our devotion of duty at Proserpine. Does that sound? Good, but why? Why? I don't know. Why are you in your corporal? I have no idea why I have no idea why the corporal and I should specifically be singled out for this commendation, excepting the fact that I must say that our devotion of duty was, I believe, above reproach at that time. Is that what you wanted? Yes. Eh? Yes, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Morris. You can tap that bit on the end. That'll work in quite well. That'll be nice, yep. Okay, now, the hearing of the third lesson. Right. According to St. Morris. <laughs> okay, terrific. You might just get a few shots of your hands and stuff while you're in the chair and that'll be it. Yep, just a minute. Okay, well, we'll just, while you do the pickups there, I'll mm. move the buzz trap as the raise. Quite better. Because I record your numbers when you... When they get going, you see? No, we'll run out of tape and you'll still be going for three. Oh, yeah, well, no, it just means I've got a bit of leftover tape on the end of my reel. I'll change when you change. So that's what happened yet before. Okay. Do you feel comfortable back there? 